Hello, everyone, and welcome into the press conference for the 2022 LWS Open, presented by the Natty along with Dynamic Discs. Joining me now is Seth Fenley. And Seth, we're going to start with, I'm going to warm you up with an easy one. What's your title? Yeah, I'm the Vice President of Finance and Administration for the Disc Golf Pro Tour. All right. Well, thank you, and glad you could join us. And that kind of leads into my first question is that this year we've seen a significant focus in expanding the crews and expanding all of our just overall hands on deck, so to speak, even to the point where some of our crew is already ahead at the next event prepping for something, and we may not even see them because, again, by the time we get there, they're at the next tournament. Explain how that's working. Yeah, so we started that sort of concept last year, and it was it was actually a lot of fun. I, you know, I I ended up doing most of that um, before we brought on additional team members. And so, like last year for this stretch of the tour, I went to preserve two weeks before and set up most of the assets, and then I went to Ledgestone the week before, set up the assets there while the preserve was happening, and then uh, after I set up the Ledgestone assets and all the preserve assets made it to Peoria. I brought them down here to Idlewild and I set them up at Idlewild. This year we've expanded that. We now are sending, um, generally we try to send one media person and two ops people, operations people ahead to the next tournament to be able to start prepping not just the course but also the media side of things as well. And speaking of some of that course and media prep, we also have this European swing that's taking place. And I know some competitors and, of course, plenty of our crew trying to get over there. There's, what, eight or nine days of covered competition when you're looking at the PCS Sula, <laughs> the European Open, and the recently announced President's Cup. That's a lot of things going on overseas as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So we have um, about nine of our staff are headed over to uh, Europe currently. Uh, we've got three of them with boots on the ground. They landed about three hours ago. We've got another uh, five or six that are going to be in the air shortly. And then the rest of our crew is still here stateside, keeping things running for Idlewild and then getting prepped for uh, the Great Lakes Open later this year or month. So talking a little bit about this event specifically, of course, we heard of some storms that rolled through yesterday, some insane heat. If you're watching any of the players' social media, we've had some you know, increased heat and humidity. How do you prep for a week like this, knowing that those are typical weather conditions? Yeah, so one of the things that we did this year in particular is we actually limited the field by one less tee time. And that doesn't sound like revolutionary, but uh, what we've encountered in the past few years at this event, we've had storms that have caused us to have to carry over a round to the next day and basically do two rounds in one day. We've also uh, ran into daylight running out, actually, because of storm delays and so we tried to make some adjustments there to be able to get us through the um it gets through the the whole round without running out of daylight or like if storms come up being able to adjust so one of the most beloved courses in the country in the central part of the country great payout great sponsors great event and we have one less tea time that's got to lead to some maybe some other frustrations or problems, which may, might, may or may not be good problems, but what else as a result of that? Yeah, so the other thing that we saw this year is we expanded the women's field for all of our events. And so with the ex expanded women's field and the increased demand, we had less spots in the men's field, and that resulted in one of ultimately ended up being our largest wait list of the season. And it's been it's been very interesting to follow sort of on the back end side of things with, I, with what I do in administration. I get to see see sort of how many people we rotate through a wait list in a given event and this event definitely the people who made it into the event uh, stayed as long as they could um, and and the ones who um, are on the wait list are you know sort of chomping at the bit to try to get in you know we one of the things that we added this year was uh, like Tuesday qualifying for all of our events and because of how quickly this event filled we were only able to sort of finagle one spot for Tuesday qualifying and so all Ultimately, we had about nine people out here, I think, who competed on Tuesday to try for that one spot to get into the tournament. Incredibly competitive for sure. Uh, another quick announcement or announcement we saw this week, and maybe you're fully versed on it. Uh, maybe you're not, and I'd understand if you're not, but quickly, what can you tell us about the Kingdome and what does that mean for uh, all of those uh, 
crypto and NFT people out there and, you know, the metaverse. Yeah, I could talk a little bit to it. I'm not fully versed in it for sure, but uh, basically we're going to be broadcasting this event in the meta metaverse inside a Kingdoms platform, and that's going to give people who are online and into uh, participating in events in that way another avenue to sort of watch. And so, you know, currently we're on Disc Golf Network, we're on YouTube uh, for the final day, and, um, and this is just another avenue for people to be able to log in and watch uh, with their friends even. Final question from me before I turn it over to Danny here. Uh, easier to get birdies in the metaverse or no? <laughs> I, I would not know. I have not been there yet. Um, but if, if it is the case, then I'll probably be headed there soon. Well, if uh, participation stays jam-packed here at this event, the metaverse might be the only way you can uh, be able to play in it. Uh, I'm going to turn it over. We got Danny Voss from the PDGA. Hi, Seth. Um, I posted a few uh, options for people to give me some questions to ask the players and stuff like this, and a lot of them focused around uh, mental and physical health. And, you know, I wanted to see uh, what you have to say about maintaining a crew that's out on the road all the time. Like, how do the DGN and the Pro Tour people, um, you know, stay positive, stay healthy, both mentally and physically? Uh, you guys are out here doing a grind. So tell us what that's yeah. like. Yeah, so Terry talked a, a little bit in one of his previous questions about how we expanded our crew. And one of the things that we did this year in expanding our crew was we added a nutrition specialist to our staff. And that person helps make sure that we have the right sort of healthy meals that we're eating on event days and not mm -hmm. just something, you know, that's easy to pick up like pizza, right? We're actually ordering healthy meals in and getting those set up for all of our staff so it's easier for them to get food. They're not like trying to scrounge for food in between rounds. Um, and then from there, you know we do try to to keep things sort of light-hearted out on the road right we have um, one of our employees set up a tag system for all of our uh, people who are playing disc golf because you know it, just like most other disc golf companies pretty much everyone on our team is a pretty avid disc golf player and so we have tags that will get out you know in between events and try to play but then also like I think back to this event specifically last year um, there's an indoor uh, go-kart racing track and we took all of our staff out to that as sort of a way in the middle of the season to take the weight and the pressure off and get out and have some fun that's awesome yeah that's great to hear making time for work and and play i mean this is kind of a dream job for a lot of people uh i guess i'll i'll kind of wrap it up with this uh which tag number do you have and if you don't have number <laughs> one who does <laughs> i don't know who has number one i think over on the bag that's literally right beside me I have like tag number 12 and that's only because I like found it uh, <laughs> which sounds even weirder when it's such a tight-knit group I actually am not on the road full-time with the road crew so I've actually never played for tags with the crew but I do have one with me gotcha so, so yeah. someone out there sweating because they lost their tag and yeah just gonna hold it over their head Love exactly it. you know the normal <laughs> tags uh tags way that's right all right uh, that's all I got for you, Seth. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Joining us now is Adam Jones. And Adam, let's let's start with your title. 
<laughs> Superman, uh, TD, extraordinaire. What, what? Give us your title. Yeah, uh, Jack of Many Trades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so glad to be here. As we were just talking about how it's so it's become so competitive, even just to get into this tournament. People from all over the country, and even when we have players already in Europe. Still have it in a massive waiting list. We just heard from Seth a few moments ago. There had to be a qualifying event. You could squeeze one more in. Do you do you recall who that lucky person is? Yeah, uh, luckily it was uh, Tony Mo Reese uh, from North of us, Dayton, Dayton area. Um, he actually shot a seven down, pull up a sixty-two. Well, let's start there. How does that seven down? How do you think that would stack up if uh, he, he brought that to round one? That's pretty good. I, I would say anything that or better would we'll probably put him in the top twenty. Okay, well, uh, some of the big conversation this year is we're seeing a few course changes. In fact, we're yes. standing not too far from one of the new baskets that will be in place. So uh, for everyone at home, kind of break down what we're seeing for the uh, couple of course changes we have. Yeah, so this course is technically a 24-hole layout. Uh, we use majority of the original 18. Uh, our newest change is on hole 3. We added to uh, course 4's basket. So it's a big dog leg right. Uh, there is a mando in play, but that's basically to keep people from throwing over where we're at, over the shelter. Uh, it shouldn't come into play other than a really bad shot, so. Uh, it's just adding another par four. And then the following hole is a completely new hole, which is using course holes five and six, which is now our new hole four. That's 722 par four. And did I see on the caddy book a couple of water carries even, yes, or at least yeah. one? Shh, the first one shouldn't come into play. <laughs> okay. I mean, you gotta really screw up to get that one. But the second one could be. That one is, that's just past the, the gaps of the trees. And uh, we figured, um, I'm curious to see how many try to get to the gaps or who lays up short to try to go over them. I mean, they're pretty tall, but it's doable. It's gonna bring some even more excitement. And then because we're adding one brand new hole, we'll lose out on hole number six. That's right. the one that uh, you kind of teed from the, the blind teeing area up into the open. Right. Usually see rollers are almost the only way to get to the pin. Exactly, it's not, that, it's not a very favorable hole. It's extremely difficult to film and catch it. Um, that was one of, the, one of the holes we could really do away with. Okay, well, uh, you know, we've already kind of elaborated on what Europe and what that impact has had. You still had the, you know, the waiting list and, and the best of the best that are here. But what are some of the other things you have to concern yourself with when putting on an event that's so successful? And first thing that comes to me is crowd control. But yes. crowd control, any weather, all those things, what are some of your concerns? Yeah, crowd control is a bigger factor year by year as the crowd grows, the fan base grows. Uh, every year we're am implementing more and more steps, more security checkpoints to, to make sure they're not interfering with the play. Uh, we have a VIP pass for, because this course is similar to like Maple Hill. Uh, you cannot fit that many people in certain areas because of how the course is designed. So that's one of the disadvantages of it, but uh, we still have a lot of space for the other holes. And so the, even the general mission, you're not missing out on a whole lot of action. Uh, this year we're seeing a new title sponsor in LWS. Yes. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for the event with the big announcement that was made a few months ago? Well, you know, Dynamic has been our, our brand sponsor for several years now, and uh, they've been huge. But LWS, uh, which stands for Landon William Schaefer, um, I believe he might be doing an interview later to explain that, because Blake, Blake Schaefer, who runs it, is here. Um, and sadly, he, uh, Landon passed away recently. Uh, I wasn't able to attend because I was actually here helping host the Deaf Disc Golf Association National Championship, and that was two weeks ago. Um, uh, but he's, he is our new accountant. Uh, he, was, uh, he was doing accounting for the Dayton Club for a while. Uh, we've known him for a few years, and it seemed like a great fit, and he, he offered to help out, and we, we needed a, a title sponsor besides a brand. and. Uh, it's been fantastic so far. He's been very supportive. Yeah, and we see that from uh, a number of people have now uh, reached out for his accounting services, yes. myself included, yeah. uh, as we're seeing disc golf really uh, pick up and have those needs and then have that yeah. tie in association has been he absolutely perfect. We have, we've had accountants in the past and they don't understand disc golf. I mean, we're, we're a basic retailer, but there's nuances with running events that they don't experience. He gets it. Uh, he certainly does, and I know he's helping a number of our players uh, with representation as well. So my last question for you would be, before I send over to Danny here, is uh, clearly you have a huge team, so many volunteers, the new sponsor you just mentioned. 
any any one in particular or any group of people that you really need to uh, shout out or call out as as uh, yeah. above and beyond? The, the most important is our staff. I mean, it takes a village, and you know, um, we're, we're probably going to average well over 150 volunteers per day. I think we had like 590 some positions. Granted, some could you know, carry three positions one day, but that's a lot of spots to fill. You never fill them all. But uh, yeah, without, without our locals and the nearby cities that come, we have people coming from over 100 miles away just to volunteer. And you can't do it without them. And they're, they're the most, probably the most vital part of running an event this size. Well, you guys have certainly built something special. Yeah. Again, an extensive waiting list and people from around the world all excited to see this course and how it's going to play, play out. Here's Danny. Hi, Adam. I'm Hi, Danny Voss with the PDGA. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I have a question from Twitter that I want to share with you. So this comes from Bengals and Baskets. Uh, they say, Idlewild is one of the most impressive courses in a public park. How does a place like this continue to challenge top pros uh, when we have seen so many events move to private venues? Yes. Yeah, uh, it's unique because uh, being a public course it has its uh, disadvantages. You know, mm -hmm. it's not easy to close it off. Uh, but you can, when you consider this, this course was designed and built in 2000, 2001. So it's been extremely difficult from the beginning. And a lot of guys don't realize is just how it's, I can't, it's tough to say easier, but it used to be extremely more tight. Huh. We've cleared out so much of the rough and areas, uh, most of it lately for better viewing for spectators. Uh, but you lose trees rather than gain them. So it's, and we, we try to continue to maintain that challenge, that difficulty. We don't want to take the teeth away from the beast, in a sense. Um, but I think this will stand the test of time. Um, there's not too many heavily wooded courses on the tour. Uh, I don't have a thing against the golf, the golf course designs. If they're done right, it can be very viable. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, uh, this is very punishing, where if you're not accurate, I don't care. it doesn't matter how far you can throw it. You've got to be precise, or it'll, it, it'll cost you big time. Gotcha. Okay, one last quick one. All right. There's going to be spectators, obviously all the players rolling in, yes. staff, volunteers, everything like that. What's the local place to go check out when they're here uh, enjoying this great event? Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of uh, right up the street is Washington Square. They've been a supporter for years. I think I've been eating their breakfast burritos and quesadillas for the last three weeks because I've basically been here about a month getting everything ready for the previous event and this event. That's awesome. All right, I'll be sure to check it out. Yeah. All right, that's Adam Jones. Thank you, and we'll be right back. And joining us now is last year's champion in Kyle Klein. And Kyle, last year you took this down in dramatic fashion, of course, the playoff. What do you remember about that? What were your feelings when you pulled into the park this year? Uh, what were some of the feelings that came about? 
Uh, just a feeling of kind of like, not so much redemption, just like familiarity, mm -hmm. I guess, is the word. Um, just good feelings pulling in, knowing that I took this down last year and I'm kind of coming back and having to defend since there's been there's been no repeat winners in this event ever, so hope what, to be the first. I'll follow that up and then say, what does that say about the course, that somebody hasn't been able to come back and defend your title? That's something you're looking to do. What does that say about this course? I think it's just hard enough where, I mean, if there's been no repeat winners. I feel like luck comes into play at some point. Sorry. <sighs> Excuse me. Okay. But, um, yeah, I feel like... Uh, what was I going to say? But what was I on? Uh, just that you, you were saying that the difficulty of defending here yeah, and what is, that means. Um, yeah, it's it's hard enough where if you're barely off at all, you probably won't. I'm not going to say you won't have a chance to uh, defend or repeat, but uh, it'll be hard to be up there without luck on your side, really. Well, I want to talk about defense because the the best event that you've had this year was a win and it was off of the disc golf pro tour but you won the 303 open in 2021 then you went back and you did defend that title in here in 2022 against very significant fields what is it about defending a title does that does that give you any uh, additional validation does that what does that do for you and your game i mean it's given me a little bit of validation um but it's just more of a familiarity thing like coming back like i've played here before I've won this event before I know how to do it and um, and at least at the 303 I felt like I feel like fate was a little on my side because things weren't necessarily going my way but things were going worse for other people <laughs> so it was kind of like it was almost destined to happen so kind of hoping that it's the same way uh, same way this week now this year hasn't been quite as stellar as last year, and I know that's a lot to live up to. You played very well last year. This year, outside of that 303 win, hasn't been quite as stellar. What is it? Uh, do you feel like is going on this year? Is there anything in particular? I'm not sure. I mean, I just feel like I play. I feel like I don't play too bad. It's just kind of like one round is holding me back. You know, like I have like three rounds to my rating, if not above, and then there's one that's. 40 points 50 points below my rating that I have to come back from when it's normally the first round which is the tough part this is almost all year it's been round one I've been I've shot myself in 60th place and I have to climb back up I just don't have enough time to kind of make that top 10 finish like I had hoped uh, and then along those lines a couple weeks ago when you did last play you finished third at the preserve you certainly got into that top 10 you just mentioned what was different about the preserve I think it was um, just everything kind of clicked together like I was I know that course I'm uh, I have fun playing on that course and just kind of everything just kind of came together like my putts were going in drives are going where I wanted to and uh, just kind of stayed away from the trouble with bogeys and I think that was the biggest thing it's gonna be a lot tougher to do here this week yeah. so my last question before I turn it over to Danny is last weekend you weren't playing you were instead on the bag. You were caddying at the U.S. Women's uh, with your significant other and Cynthia. Is that more or less stressful than you playing? I would say more, at least for <laughs> me, because I have to stand there and watch. And I, I know I can't do anything about what's going to happen. I just have to wait and see what happens. All so, right. Did, uh, did you have fun, though? I did. All right. Here's Danny. Hey there. Danny Voss with the PDJ. Um. Firstly, I just kind of want to ask, like, and Terry hit on this earlier, but what was the first feeling you had when you kind of rolled in here and you were like, oh, yeah, this is the spot. Like, this is this is my course, I guess. Like, you seem pretty confident rolling in here. Um, is, can you expand on that a little? Yeah, just I kind of – I, I mean, we got in uh, – I don't remember what day, like Monday, Monday evening, and I pulled in and I just cracked a smile on my face pulling in knowing that, like, seeing, like, uh, going up to hole one, I was like, I like this place. Sure. Just, uh, just good memories here. Very good. Um, so Terry also mentioned your performance at the Preserve, uh, the last Pro Tour stop uh, for you. Um, is there anything that you picked up in that performance? I mean, that was a podium finish. You're heating up. Uh, anything from, from that uh, tournament that you're going to translate into your performance this weekend? Um. I mean, I hope to translate everything, to be honest. I was like hitting lines, making putts, but the biggest thing I think I have to take away from the preserve is make your circle two putts. Like, 45 feet and in, it's getting to the point today in this uh, 
in this day and age of disc golf where 45 feet is almost like a you have to hit those most of the time it feels like to be in contention gotcha um so going back to last year again you know obviously we've hit on the playoff and how that dramatic conclusion led to your victory here um you know kind of walk us through what that was like and maybe some of those highlights that are still sticking with you mentally uh that you're gonna kind of reflect on when you're out on the course here this weekend yeah the biggest thing for me was hole two the hole that i wanted on i i mean i played the i this is gonna be my third year playing this tournament and out of the six tries or no seven out of the seven tries i've played hole two i've only birdied it once and that was in the playoff so I wasn't too comfortable on that hole. I knew I was throwing good tee shots, but the second shot just always gave me trouble. So I just had to step up and just hope I threw the right shot. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, that was, that's the one thing that sticks with me is uh, being able to throw that shot in a pressure situation. Okay, so let's let's say you're having a conversation with, like, an AM player, an MA1 guy that's going into, uh, you know, a playoff for his local B tier, for instance. Yeah. How are you going to communicate, you know, that feeling and that mental preparation to to a player that's kind of coming up and just kind of first getting into that sort of experience? Yeah, I guess I'd say this isn't anything I guess you haven't done before. Like you've played this course, you know how to throw these holes, and if you've thrown them well, just don't change anything. I guess the stakes would be different, obviously, but um, yeah, I'd say just don't change up what you've been doing. If it's worked, it works. Gotcha. All right, last question. Is there a particular hole or shot or anything like that out here on this course that you're really looking forward to executing uh, this weekend? Uh, I'd say like the the back nine is where I'm looking to execute. Cause okay. I'd say the back nine is kind of where I struggled a little bit last year. No. I think it was a front nine. I think it was a front nine. Uh, excuse me. But the front nine, definitely. I think I was, I was definitely a little, not rusty, but just not... I was definitely sloppy on the front nines last year uh, here, so that's definitely where I'm looking to clean up. Okay, great. Uh, well, that's all I got. This was Kyle Klein, and uh, thanks, everyone. We'll be right back. All right. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Joining us now is Missy Gannon, who is our runner-up in 2021. I'm going to get to some stats for you later, okay. Missy, but I want to talk first about last weekend. Mm -hmm. You finished 10th mm -hmm. at the major, the US WDGC over in Madison, Wisconsin. You averaged 962 over four rounds. Mm -hmm. That is almost down to a decimal <laughs> point 
your rating. Right. So my question would be, you finished in 10th, you were the high, eighth highest rated competitor there. How did that performance feel? Um, I mean, it definitely felt lacking. I think I had two solid rounds and then two not so solid rounds. And out there, you had to have four solid rounds to be able to uh, be in that top, you know, podium uh, spot. So, um, you know, overall, I think I I, uh, I did okay. Um, I'm happy to get back into the top ten and keep that top ten. Uh, alive for me but um yeah i mean I, I i just certainly felt a little bit off during a couple of rounds um it's it's those courses where you feel like you know if you're not scoring you're you're somebody else's you know so and that's the truth so um there's a little bit of different kind of pressure at those kind of courses so uh yeah maybe i was just feeling that that pressure to score well and then we come to this course which i feel like is almost the exact opposite mm -hmm. in terms of the technicality. We saw relatively open and relatively short mm -hmm. over in Madison at the major. And now you're talking about, again, more than 9,000 feet mm -hmm. with a lot of tight lines. What do you do to adjust both mentally and physically? Um, yeah, I think, I think honestly, um, it's, I, I love this kind of course. Um, I feel like anytime you get a course that you can, birdie a hole just as easy as you can double bogey it um, or even just bogey it I think that that's just um, a perfect design um, I love being able to scramble I love being able to still throw open bigger shots um, it just has a little bit of everything and you really have to earn your birdies and I think that that's the kind of golf that I um, I like more than say you know having to having to get the birdie on every hole it's more just you know playing clean and uh, getting the birdies when you can uh, I'll expand on that just for a moment. And some would say, well, if you can birdie it and you can double bogey it, is the course fluky? Mm -hmm. I, I have my answer for this course, mm -hmm. but what would you say to somebody that asks that? I don't know. Maybe because I've played this uh, course so many times, it doesn't feel fluky to me anymore because I just know the fairways so well. I know if I end up left on a hole, it's not good. Or, you know, I, I just I know it like the back of my hand. Um, there are a few new holes out here, but I think that overall... Um, I don't know. I think it just the. I think it just makes for really interesting golf. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's just always been a course that I love coming to. And we're hearing one of the course components <laughs> overhead right now is there's an airport very close by. <laughs> and after I pause for just a moment, yes. <laughs> I'll ask. Uh, 2018, you finished 15th. You didn't cash. 2019, 15th. You didn't cash. 2020, <laughs> fifth place. And that was only a few strokes behind Ellen, who went on to win. And then last year, second. So 15, 15, fifth, second. <laughs> uh, the only question I have written down there is, do you have this place figured out? <laughs> I think now I do. Um, so this is also a special place for me because it's the first um, tour event that I ever attended when I finally took the leap to go on tour. So, um, you know, it beat me up and I it maybe wasn't the best place to come to for the first touring event that I ever went but went to but um, then it sort of it still was it was a course that I found myself going out to practice even after my rounds my competitive rounds were over it's one of those courses that I just wanted to figure out and I wanted to keep playing because it's, it's fun it's challenging um, and yeah it's just uh, I think it's probably one of my top courses that I my favorite courses in the in the country we hear that often so my final question would be then we're seeing a lot of competitors get ready they're either uh, already in Norway or mm -hmm. they're you know prepping to get to Europe for the European Open uh, we don't have you listed as going overseas playing either of those events so the fans would probably wonder well, why not um, I wasn't sure about travel um, and I kind of didn't want to make all of these plans and then you know something happened with the protocols or whatever um, it seems like everything's pretty much ironed out now but it was so uncertain back then when I had to kind of start thinking about what my tour schedule was going to look like um, and whether that was an going to include the Europe, Europe swing um, so yeah I I didn't I, I didn't do it this year, but I do hope and plan to get there next year. So. All right. We know everybody's going to be looking forward to that. Well, mm -hmm. while you're here stateside, we're also looking forward to more of you and a few extra events. Mm -hmm. Here's Danny Voss from the PDGA. Mm -hmm. Hi there, Missy. Hello. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. So uh, 
Last pro tour stop for you. Like Terry mentioned, second place of the preserve. Mm -hmm. That's uh, congratulations, Thank first you. of all. <laughs> Very good podium finish. Thank you. Um, it made me wonder, do you, as a as a player that's coming off of a podium finish on a pro tour stop, do you like look back at that course and think, okay, this hole translates to where I am this week? Are, could, do you have any examples or parallels that you can point out between the preserve and, and here? Yeah, actually, I think there are. I don't know about any specifics, but um, there certainly were are holes at the preserve. You know, people say that it's pretty much wide open, but it's really not. I mean, there are definitely holes that make you have to throw shapes and, um, you know, there's, there's dog leg rights, there's dog leg lefts. So, um, specifically, I can't, I can't quite think of anything, uh, that directly correlates, but, um, I, there are a lot of holes like that here as well. So even just the no, new hole three right behind us, it's a dog leg to the right. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a couple of those holes out at the preserve. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I just, I pretty much just throw thrashers all the time. So that's really all I'm going to be doing out here <laughs> as well. So when, anytime I can do that, I'm in pretty good shape. No, hey, nothing wrong with a <laughs> simplistic approach. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, kind of staying with this course is there any particular hole that you're really excited about you know whether it's the tee shot or the approach or just kind of being on it because it's picturesque or anything like that yeah actually uh the y hole is uh, slightly redesigned and they have a uh the the pin is pushed back quite a bit from um last year and it did play a little soft for a par four last year but now i think it's like super fair things could happen good or bad you have to throw a placement shot and then get yourself in a good position for a pretty technical approach to a, a, a smaller green with some uh, OB on the left so um, I'm excited to see how that hole plays now that it's redesigned and I think it's a, a much better design than last year gotcha looking forward to seeing that uh seen that hole in action mm -hmm. okay I got one more for you and I'm gonna paint just a little bit of a picture for you so okay. bear with me um <laughs> So I believe it was round two last week, and it was hole six, right, at Token, where you had that roll away, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so th this is exactly the reaction I was sure. looking for. So that your reaction to that situation, not only kind of turning around, smiling, just like you did just now, mm -hmm. but then just absolutely canning that putt, <laughs> just sort of was, in my opinion, was one of the most like exciting and wholesome uh, you know, moments from that tournament. Yeah. Um, clearly being in like a positive frame of mind, mm -hmm. I, it seemed like that helped you. So, you know, how do you maintain that positivity on the course? Like, do you have any lessons for, you know, young women golfers that are trying to get onto the tour and mm -hmm. things like that? Any advice w with regard to that positive mental attitude? Yeah, it never helps to have a negative attitude. It's never going to make your shot better. Um, you know, things are going to happen. Uh, a sh uh, a putt like that, I knew the risk. Yeah. I mean, everybody knows that if you hit on the side of a basket that's perched on the side of a hill with rocks underneath it, the only real thing that's going to happen is it's going to roll away to some capacity. So I knew that that was possible. I knew I had to, you know, putt it high, and I didn't. I uh, didn't putt it high enough. Um, so I kind of just laughed at it because it's. I, I expect it. That's one of the things that's going to happen if you don't if you don't make the putt, or at least you know airball it or something <laughs> but um yeah so that's just i think that was a perfect example of just letting it go and trying harder on the next the next try um and that can go from hole to hole shot to shot you might have had a bad hole but now you know you're on to the next one that's and true. you can't do anything about what just happened so just keep your positive mindset and attack the next one very good all right this was missy gannon and uh, we'll be right back thank you missy thank you
And joining us now is Andrew Marweed. And Andrew, last year, the playoff, it all went down not too far from where we're standing. What were some of the vibes, the feels, when you pulled back into the park here after, uh, after one year? Uh, it's definitely a weird feeling, you know, a bit uh, a good feeling because this is always my favorite stop on tour. Uh, it's very different from the rest of the courses. It's a course I know I can shoot well at, but definitely was a little weird, you know, coming back here, uh, you know, just remembering all the stuff that happened last year, but just gives me more determination to do one stroke better this year, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and then I have to ask, I mean, as we said, a fellow Michigander in Kyle Klein, who's ultimately got you, is it the course? Is it Kyle? Is it just the overall score? What is it that you're looking to seek the most revenge on? Uh, probably hole 17, and I think, I think I'm going to lay up this year, you know, <laughs> play it short right, go for a 40-footer, hopefully make the putt, and try not to bogey that hole this year. Uh, let's. Yeah, I'm going to jump ahead then, since you're talking about putting. I looked up some stats on you, and you and Isaac Robinson are both tied at 90%. You have 300 makes out of 334 attempts from C1X this year, which leads all DGPT event players. What does that mean to you? Um, I take pretty good pride in my putting. I started out not being one of the you know best putters, but put a lot of work into it, and I've been one of the top putters for the last three years now. Um, and it kind of works out, you know, like I'm not quite good enough to park it every time, but I'm good enough to get it to 60 feet, miss my putt, and tap in a 15 footer. So that helps too. But uh, I've been putting a lot of work in my putting. Uh, I got some new putters this year with DGA. You know, the Splatterstone Steady BLs have been, you know, working wonders for me. So as long as the putt stays hot this weekend, uh, you know, it should be a pretty fun time. Yeah, and you clearly, you were one of the big uh, off-season switches this year where you had transition from Innova over to DGA. I'm not even going to ask if you're dialed in with all your plastic. I know the professional that you are this, this late in the season. I'm sure you're dialed in. But the, the follow-up really to that already is, what have you learned about both yourself and your game in transitioning from one major manufacturer to another? Yeah, um, it's definitely a big change. You know, I'm loving the, the new plastic and all, you know, the people working over at DGA. It's been an awesome experience so far. But uh, something I learned was, you know, at the start of the season, I was trying to replicate different shots with different discs, trying to compare them to, you know, previous molds that I've been throwing. And it's kind of a little bit different where you have to throw a new disc, but kind of learn new shots with those new discs. Uh, but uh, overall, I've um, it's, it's coming pretty well. You know, I'm throwing a lot of the same type of shots, different kind of plastics and over stability and stuff like that. But uh, I, yeah, definitely I'm pretty dialed in at this point. I'm uh, excited to showcase that uh, first round on feature card. Yeah, we can no longer use any of those excuses of, well, they've got new plastic. Uh, all of our professionals like yourself, I, I know are ready to go and you've been working really hard. Uh, something else I saw last year is that nearly 30% of your earnings last year, as in $8,500, came from back-to-back -back weeks. A fourth at Ledgestone and then you came here where you uh, took that tie for second, or that ultimately second here at this event. What was it about that stretch of those two weeks last year? And is there anything you feel like you're, you're going to channel from such a, a successful stretch last year? Yeah, I think ever since I've been on tour, you know, last three and a half years, it's always the second half of the season for me. Uh, now the first half of the season's done, uh, kind of take a breath and focus on the second half. But those courses don't really fit my game to, you know, the best they can. It's a lot of shots where you have to throw over 500 feet and that's just something I can't do so you just kind of have to you know bite your tongue and move on about that and you know play the best you can but the course is the second half of the season much more wooded and not as much wind with the trees blocking it helps my push putt uh, and it's something where I don't have to you know take a 12 speed driver and throw as hard as I can backhand every single time I can take my fairway drivers you know throw a forehand right on the middle and make my putts for birdie. And no surprise, I've seen you be, continue to be successful anytime you're in Michigan or in the Midwest. But compare for everyone out there what it's like to come to the biggest stages here on the Pro Tour as opposed to when you're in Michigan, people, you know, you're an odds on favorite to win or, of course, finish on the podium at a more local event. But what is it like to come to the largest stage and then have all your eyes on you? Uh, when you're here as a, a relative newcomer to the tour in the last couple of years. Right, yeah, I definitely love going back home to Michigan and playing some <laughs> B-tiers and stuff, but, you know, I've always been a, a fierce competitor. I love winning. When I go to a tournament, you know, I want to win, and I want to believe I can win, uh, but I'm also a realistic person. So, you know, when I go to a, a pro tour event, I'm not, unfortunately, thinking I'm going to win this one because realistically I'm like, I'm going to try to get top 20, top 10. So, but this is, the you know, maybe one of the three events all year where I, you know, when I drive, when I pull in the, in the course, I'm thinking like this could be my time. This is be a good tournament I could win. 
Uh, any quick takeaways on the new, the two new holes, we'll call it. Three's changed and four's brand new, but I'll just call them two new holes. Any uh, immediate reaction to those this year? Uh, I, I enjoy them. They're not, you know, usually when they change a par three to a par four, it's, uh, I know I'm not a huge favorite of it, but these par fours are, you know, they're pretty favorable. You don't have to crush a huge drive. It's uh, a lot of placement shots and, uh, I think, you know, out of the two par fours, so it's four total shots, I think three of them are going to be sidearms for me. So, you know, I'm totally fine with it. They're nice holes. They look pretty. So it should be fun to see how they play out this weekend. Well, I'm sure this year you definitely like to uh, get things done in 54 holes, hopefully on top. Sure. Best of luck to you. Here's Danny Voss from the PDGA. Thanks, Terry. Hi, Andrew. How's it going? It's going well. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, so Terry sort of hit on it when he said, what was it like kind of rolling in here, you know, kind of getting those same feeling from, from last year, um, kind of diving a little bit deeper into that. Is there any specific lesson from last year that you're going to take into this year? You mentioned maybe laying up on 17 and things like that. Are there any other more broader, more holistic uh, approaches that you're going to have this year? Uh, I, I don't really think so. I think because last year went so well for me, I kind of stuck to my game plan. You know, there was a few of the holes where I told myself I was going to lay up. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget which hole it is this year, but that uh, 400 foot with the, the water on the left side, I laid up last year. I think I'm going to go for it this year unless it's a headwind. So um, I actually might try to be a little more aggressive this year just because I know I, I might need those one or two extra birdies. But, you know, as long as I stay bogey free or one hole from it, I think it should be, you know, pretty close to the top. Okay. Um, Looking back at your uh, PDGA player profile, we see you go and compete at plenty of B tiers and A tiers in between these elite series stops. What what is it? What is it about those events that kind of keep you sharp and ready for the next, you know, big time uh, disc golf pro tour event? Uh, I would say, I mean, obviously, besides from playing every weekend, keeping that competitive edge, it's uh, you know, kind of a, a nice little spark to not maybe have the top 10 players in the world there. So give me a little <laughs> sure. better chance to win and get back in that winning mindset, or at least, uh, you know, coming down to the, the line of it, you know, and making a push for the win and, you know, having that uh, last second push to, you know, spark that side of me. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, one last very quick question. Uh, I asked uh, Kyle this, this same question regarding a playoff. If you could give advice to an amateur player uh, that's you know maybe encountering their first playoff at one of those A or B tiers. You know what would you you know say to them if you were their caddy or something like that? I would just say take a breath. You know I was uh, um, I'm kind of pretty used to the nerves now being on tour for such a long time, but uh, it gets pretty nervous out there in yeah. a big spot. And even if it's just a lead card at a B tier, you know just take a breath. You're just playing disc golf. You're having fun. It's not that big of a deal. Great. All right. That was Andrew Marwe. Thank you very much, Andrew. And Thank we'll you. be right back. And joining us now is Rebecca Cox. And Rebecca, 
We're going to backtrack to the major just a few days ago, taking mm -hmm. place over in Madison, Wisconsin. We saw that you started out pretty hot and you finished pretty hot, but then it just feels like things slowed down a little bit in the middle two rounds. Is there anything you can attribute that to? Um, well, just my putting confidence felt a little bit off and I don't know, I just felt a little off that weekend. I, I can't really like dial it down to one singular thing. So playing in Madison, relatively short courses, definitely open. And then we come to this course. Not only do you know it very well, but a very, very different topography and just overall feel and vibe out here. Mm -hmm. Explain how you can mentally just transition from where you were to where you're going to be this week. Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, the courses last weekend, they almost reminded me a little bit of the courses I grew up on. Um, you know, even though they weren't that long, it was like, objectively the hole was you know very birdieable and very gettable but there are four thousand places in the fairway you can get in trouble so um <clears throat> yeah just coming to idlewild is always a fun time for me and just the mental shift is, is just more like i'm coming back home and you know I'm, it's almost like i'm on vacation out here <laughs> hey, and uh, again clarify for everyone this course is near your home course, but you weren't coming out here daily, right? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Idlewild is not a course that you would come out <laughs> and play daily for sure. But um, yeah, it was one of like a handful of courses that I had growing up. So um, we would make the trip, uh, especially for tournaments and stuff. I played the 18 hole layout, the 24 hole layout. I played pretty much every pin and tee pad placement. So uh, yeah, I've seen the course grow over the last 10, 15 years. So one of those things that maybe you haven't seen is the new uh, playing from hole three to four mm -hmm. and then five to six as we it was explained by adam uh, two different holes for us this year what's your take on those and have you seen those used before um i at this tournament i have not seen those pins used i've played these pins before just like in different directions and stuff but um yeah i i, I really like the changes i i thought six was kind of tweenery or just mm -hmm. like you know kind of a whatever hole so um i think these two holes were a good replacement for that uh, quickly backtracking for a moment to last weekend, we often see your dad's your dad mm -hmm. at events, but we got to see your mom out at an event. Is that going to be something more common, or was that just a special scenario that we saw your mom in Madison? Um, well, yeah, she actually texted me and uh, was like, "Hey, can I watch you around tomorrow?" And I was like, "I play Idlewild next weekend. Like, do you have your calendar mixed up or something?" And she's like, "No, I'm on my way to Wisconsin." So that was a huge surprise for me, and she hasn't gotten to see me play in person in probably I don't know probably since she was playing which was years ago um but she i mean she's going to come see me at this tournament and hopefully that's going to be a more common thing for her well that's certainly awesome to see it was yeah. a pleasure to get to see her and meet her um beaver state fling and portland two of your best performances that we've seen here mm -hmm. in 2022 so what is it about those places and and do you just need to pretend you're always in oregon or what is it about <laughs> those places um gosh i'm not sure i i just felt really comfortable with my bag and i felt like those courses played really well to my game um and i don't know i just i just felt really comfortable on those courses and i feel really comfortable here too all right then the final one that i have is that you've only missed cash twice this year but you're already on pace to exceed any other career earnings for a, for a full year you're certainly on pace for that Talk about the fields and the competition that you've been facing over these last couple of years. You're earning more money, but yet the fields are getting tougher, it feels like. Oh, yeah. Um, it's been pretty insane. I remember the years where, like, having 24 women was, like, a big deal to us. And even just playing this past weekend with 90 women in our division, like, I never even thought that would happen in, the, you know, just the short time that I've been on tour. So um, it is really incredible to see so many new faces, so many new women, so many new skill sets. And the competition is just, whew, it's, it's tough, man. It, you got to play way more consistent now. And especially nowadays, I just feel like it really comes down to putting because sure you can throw further, but you know, sometimes that's just not what the separation is in our division. So uh, it's really exciting to see. Well, we're excited to have you playing courses, a course you're very familiar with. Looking forward to your performance this weekend. I've got Danny Voss from the PDGA with a couple more. Hi, Rebecca. Good to see you again. Hi, good to see you too. So, Terry hit on this already, um, how close you, you live to here and all this. You know, if we look at your PDGA player profile, you know, it lists Cincinnati as your hometown, so not too far away. Um, how are you going to take advantage of that fact this weekend? Um, well, it's it's kind of funny because 
I kind of think of Idlewild as the like the Northwood Black of its time. You know, sh it's sure it's not as hard as it used to be, but you know, I, I was playing back when these fairways were tight, and mm -hmm. to me nowadays, I mean, they almost look wide open. So. Um, I, I think it's just that comfort and that confidence and just knowing this course so well and ha having, you know, seeing all the fairways and just how it's grown. I think, I don't know, it's kind of a, an advantage for me, at least I feel like just because, you know, you know, five years ago, that tree wasn't there, you know. Oh, man, you should have seen this hole when that, so that and that tree was there. So, yeah, it's just it feels more open to me. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So uh, when you're out on the course, do you think you'll ever kind of go back and and think of how this course looked in kind of more of a historical context and and then appreciate where you are now like how do those two those two feelings jive together ah man it's kind of just nostalgic even just playing like the new layout because man I haven't I haven't played at that basket or that basket in several years um there's some like holes that we just completely skip um when we play the championship layout like this and I mean, I just walk by them and I'm like, man, I remember when I used to play this hole. Oh man, I wish I, I wish we still played this hole. Like even old 17 when you're walking up to 18's um, tee pad. I mean, I love that hole, but it's gone now. <laughs> gotcha. But it's just really like, I don't know. I just have a lot of fun out here. So Terry alluded to this as well. You know, you've had uh, plenty of top 10 finishes recently. 10th mm -hmm. uh, at the Preserve, 4th at Portland including a first place finish at the 303 uh, Open, the A tier, congratulations. Um, so you're riding this wave of you know, great finishes. Um, how do you channel those, that, that positivity into you know, a good mental outlook uh, at, a, at an, another elite series event um, this weekend? Right, um, I think it kind of stems from feeling like my game is starting to fall in, into place now like I, I kind of took a step back with changing my form and then you know with that came you know changing my putt and you know just my mental game I worked on in the off season as well so I just feel like it's all starting to come together a little bit and it just feels really good when you're playing well you know I, I finally feel like I'm in that part of the grind where you know sometimes you feel like man I really need to rest or man this is really starting to get on me but I'm, I'm in that place where it's like man I'm, I finished really well I can't wait to get to the next one I can't wait to play the next one so it feels really good to be in like that kind of headspace when you're touring excellent uh, thank you for joining us Rebecca and uh, we'll be right back thank you
Joining us now is Corey Ellis. And Corey, welcome, first of all. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Thanks for having me. Well, we're glad to have you. I want to bust out the last couple of years as I researched at the Idlewild Open. We've got 16th place finish in 2018. 2019 was 24th. 2020 was 18th. And then last year, busted in the top 10. Ninth place finish. Dare I ask, have you figured the course out? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, 18's been the one that's always given me <laughs> trouble over the years. Like, I think last year I, w I took like like five, six, and a six or something like that. And if I'd parred out, I think I would have won if you look at the scores. But uh, I've played her a lot over the years. Uh, I'm only like two and a half hours away, a little over. And uh, just a lot of beach tiers and stuff I've won on this course. So it's, it's one of my favorites to play. Well, yeah, that jumped ahead to my very next question, which is that you are uh, less than three hours from here. So tell us about some of your history here, some of the successes, or maybe things that you've seen that others wouldn't know because we're just here for this one week this year. Tell us, give us a little insight into this course or this property. Uh, well, there's 24 holes total. And uh, this year they combined hole three and uh, hole four, which is pretty nice. Actually, I really like the change. Uh, I'd rather play a hard or a par four than a hard par three, you know. Uh, but uh, we're actually playing the uh, the long tee pad on the hole after that that I didn't even know was there. I've played here for <laughs> ten plus years, and uh, but yeah, it's it's a really challenging course. I feel like it's it's pretty cool how this course is uh, kept up with the times, you know. Yeah, and what does that say? We we you know we've talked about this having a huge waiting list everybody's dying to get here they always talk about being in their top five maybe even their top favorite course in the world but you just said keeping up with the times how is all of that possible uh i think it's got to do with the local scene you know jason and adam and those guys at the natty they do an amazing job with the with keeping up with all the courses around here especially you know i, I think a lot of the guys if they have time should check out mount airy because that course is up there too it's amazing that's that's where their headquarters is and everything and it's really i think it's a lot to do with those guys you know all the local people really take care of it i mean they have trash cans on the t signs on every hole and keep the course clean and the parks keep it manicured for the most part and it, it certainly has been an incredible collaboration and partnership that they've had here which keeps us coming back year after year so right now i see you sitting in second place in the dgpt standings for c2 putting at 38.31 percent and that certainly matters. Um, last year, you finished at 42.86%. Do those three or four percentage points feel that much different to you? Absolutely not. I, I, I mean, we wouldn't know if they weren't a stat that people keep track of, you know? And, and I think that not all the times they're accurate. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. if someone's keeping track, they don't get one right or something. And it's hard to, even for us to go back and it's not worth changing one putt for or something, you know? But... Uh, it's just something cool to, to know that uh, people like the analytics. Yeah, and, and as I'm looking at it, you're also sitting at about 85% in C1X this year. And I bring all this up because last year you were first on the tour in C1X, and you were also first on the tour from C2. Two incredible statistics when you talk about being literally the best putter in the world. And now this year, you're sitting at 85% in C1X, where Marweed and Robinson are tied at 90% and sitting in that first place spot. Do you feel like, do you personally feel like you're putting any better or worse? Uh, I don't feel like anything's really changed. Uh, the big difference I would think would be the wind this year. Mm. It has been very windy, like Emporia. You, <laughs> you, a 25 footer might as well be a 50 footer out there when it's 40 mile an hour winds, you know? I mean, you saw like James uh, from 12 feet hit and come straight back at him and he didn't do anything wrong. And, I mean, it's pretty hard, you know, when your disc just falls out of the basket, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> too soon, too. No, I, was, I wasn't uh, initially going to go there, but, um, you know, clearly that was talked about. And, and uh, unfortunately, you're the example that has been made of that. It sounds like that is also prompting change. So how does that feel for you? I mean, it sucks, you know, kind of got the, the bad end of the stick on that one, you know, but it's just that kind of shows the world the luck I have sometimes, it seems like. It may, well, I'll follow that up. Do you feel like you're sometimes just things don't go your way? Is there? Absolutely. <sighs> Absolutely. It's just the way that it is, you know, but it, it takes, you know, it, it this mental stability, I think, and just try to, you know, that's the biggest leap in my game over the past couple of years is 
the mental side of the sport. And what have you done to address that or to overcome that or, or, uh, well, or strengthen yourself in that way? Well, I'm a year and six months, a little over sober. I used to, you know, enjoy beer a little bit too much, but you know, that's that. I feel like that's helped dramatically. Is there anything that you could, you know, uh, I don't want to say make a plea, but is there anything you want to say to anyone out there that might feel like the, a life change might be in order? Uh, it's not easy. You just got to do it and commit. And uh, the first three months are the hardest. And then, and, and then you don't even want it anymore. Well, as you're telling me that you feel sometimes as if you're unlucky and yet you're putting up stats that make you the number one putter in 2021, if you do get lucky, I think the world certainly better watch out because <laughs> that would be pretty incredible. Here's Danny Voss from the PDJ. He's got a few more for you. Hello, Corey. Danny Howdy, Voss. Danny. Um, thank you, Terry, for kind of leading us into my first question. Um, you know, we are a little bit uh, over halfway through the tour season, and, uh, you know, it's a grind out there, of course. And as Terry alluded to, you know, uh, your third place at Beaver State Fling, however bittersweet that might have been, evidently. Um, you know, fourth place at the Champions Cup was a phenomenal shot for you as well. Uh, and plenty of top 15 finishes, you know. You you hit on that, on that mental attitude. Uh, what does it take to kind of grind through it? You know, what tricks do you have to, to keep yourself positive And how are you going to apply those this weekend? Uh, I like to remind myself, never give up, no matter what. It doesn't matter. It, the only shot that really matters and to me is the shot that you're taking right now. Uh, that's the only one that you can control, and that's the only one that should be on your mind. Uh, that and really just breathing, honestly. Like, focusing on your breathing helps tremendously. Like, I, I, I know everyone's seen James Conrad's throw in a million times, but if you watch him, he, he's really controlling his breathing before he throws, and I think that has a little bit to do with helping concentrate. Gotcha. All right. Um, real quick, just to wrap up, uh, in, in a word, you know, can you describe what it's like to be at this particular venue, you know, for this special elite series event and, and everything like that? Like what's one word that could describe this experience for you? One word. Memorable. Yeah. Because this place is, nothing but that it's there's full of memories for me and i'm open to create many more excellent well said uh this was Corey ellis and we'll be right back thank you Corey. thank you
Joining us now, we have Chris Dickerson. And Chris, I'm going to throw the last four years at you at okay. this event. We've got 8th, 27th, 2nd, and 12th. Uh-huh. Feels like a roller coaster, but what does that say about the course and how you play against it? The course is a little bit of a roller coaster. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got some changes out there use this year. I think overall it made it a little bit better, but uh, there are some tight gaps with OB uh, under those gaps. So that sets up for big stroke swings whenever uh, somebody throws a bad shot or gets a little unlucky. So, yeah, it can happen to you out here. Now we're looking at holes three and four, which we actually be happen to be uh, positioned very close to at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what's your overall take on those two changes? Not bad. Um, I would rather see hole three as the par three, just without the the OB Creek that runs mm. in front of it. Uh, I think that would be the best possible hole three uh, where it's at. I do like hole four though. I think it sets up as a really good hole. It um, requires a position shot, and then you've got a throw an accurate shot through a gap over some water so i do like hole four well and that brings me to another question which is you often speak of or at least have thoughts maybe sometimes you keep to yourself about course design Mm -hmm. this is one of the most beloved courses on the tour ever almost everybody puts it in their top five so i've got to lob it up to my my official uh reviewer here in in yourself what do you think about this track Overall, I think it's pretty good. Um, I don't know if I would put it in my top five or not, just because I'm very picky. And <laughs> it's not the difficulty of the course for me, it's the overall experience. So it's gotta be challenging, but it also has to be fun, if that makes sense. It, it does, and then when I think of the experience of coming here, and we talked with the tournament director, there's a atmosphere mm-hmm. that the fans they're getting louder the volunteers are increasing year after year Mm -hmm. the wait list is longer than it's ever been before it seems as if this place has it all does that play into your experience as well as in terms of the extracurriculars and the other people that are here taking it in um not really just because uh whenever i think of top five courses i think of the course itself not anything that's going on outside of it now if it was like top five tournaments it'd be a different story it might rank a little higher for me um, and I'm not saying that it's not a top five course. It's just not my personal opinion that it's not in my top five. Okay. I mean, it might be right there at number six, number seven, <laughs> but. It, it's know. hovering, and it's certainly yeah. in an elite class. It is. Um, you know, when I look at last year and you finished 12th, you averaged 1033 golf, which is 12 points below your rating at the time. Mm-hmm. What is it about the kicks that you mentioned or uh, about the scrambling that needs to take place out here? Uh, what what are some of those? Does it give you nightmares? Does it give you excitement? What does it do for you? Uh, I like the scrambling out here, um, but you have to be smart about it. You can't just be throwing uh, hero shots, uh, as people like to call them all the time, because those will get you into more trouble and the strokes will just continue to pile up. Um, but no, the, those kicks... They can be brutal. Uh, Just like I said, the ones that, the holes that just happen to have OB under the tight gaps, if you throw a slightly errant shot and you get a bad kick, not only are you out of position, but you're also out of bounds. So you could get punished twice on one hole just by throwing one mediocre shot. Well, speaking of of kicks and punishing people out there, when we're seeing you only play really one event in the last two months, Tennessee Mm -hmm. States, you became a six-time champion there. What has it been like for the last two months where disc golf, competitive disc golf, hasn't been your top priority? Yeah, um, it's been a lot of rest, a lot of rest. Um, That doesn't mean I haven't played. I tried to play almost every day, uh, weather permitting, but competitive disc golf i played one league round and the only reason i played that they're ratings killers most of the time but the only reason i played that was because i was itching to get back out and compete um so yeah i'm really looking forward to getting back out into the the bigger tournaments and playing on competitive cards yeah that that league round i think was rated about 1033 mm-hmm. does, does yep. that frustrate you it does a little bit because <laughs> um so it, it was a flex start mm-hmm. i watched the ratings come in and uh, it, it was like an alternate layout too. So it, it actually rated a little bit better than uh, the course itself. Uh, so I was watching the ratings come in and I was like, okay, yeah, I could go out there and actually shoot my rating and then I played decent. Mm. So that's frustrating, um, but yeah. 
Well, I, I, I saw that. Uh, that jumped right <laughs> off the page at me as you playing in that one league round. You had the hot score, but as you said, it was just a little bit under your rating. Mm-hmm. With all of that and resting and relaxing, and I know you've had um, you know some your wife and some uh, uh, medical procedures to attend to and just everybody getting rested up. We love seeing that you're back out on the tour. My last question for you, though, is did I see you in a dress shirt last week? You did. Um, Brittany's mom's wedding was last week, so we attended that. I got all dressed up. Um, it happens every now and then. <laughs> it, it doesn't happen all, all the time, I mean, obviously, but every now and then. She she turned down the camouflage dress shirt, the button-up. You know, what's really funny is uh, <laughs> I, I, I've got a few Carhartt shirts, and the two button-up shirts that I had, it was either the blue button-up or it was a it was a green one. And whenever I pulled it out of the closet, it was a little dark. It was camouflage. <laughs> so there was a 50-50 chance, and uh, we went blue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you look great. Here's Danny Voss from the PDGA. Hey, Chris. Good seeing you again. Good seeing you. Yeah, so uh, Terry hit on this, winning the Tennessee State Championships for the sixth time, if you count the MA1 victory, mm-hmm. um, which we all will, of course. <laughs> uh, so clearly, you know, you're, clearly you're a guy that likes to really get comfortable, you know, with, with those uh, continued successes at, at that particular event. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you're clearly somebody that likes that familiarity. So how are you balancing you know, whether it's breaks for physical and mental health and stuff like that with, you know, maintaining that competitive edge when you come back out onto the elite series? Like what's your, what's your secret sauce for that success? Um, it's really good to have some time at home. So being able to go to events and go back home, kind of like a, uh, a place that you're very familiar with, mm-hmm. uh, that's helpful. But also whenever you're on the road and you're not able to do that, um, having somewhere like our RV, for example, somewhere that feels like home. Um, just being able to relax in a place like that, I think that's probably the best for uh, recovery and stuff like that. Very good. All right, one last quick one for you. Um, checking your U-Disc stats, your uh, very highly rated in fairway hits, your third in uh, that category, and uh, Circle 1 in regulation, you're currently listed as second. Um, seems like on a course like this those two skills are going to come in extremely handy uh it including those two statistics are there a- any other you know parts or aspects of your game that you're really going to lean on uh this weekend um i mean not just turn this tournament any other tournament you've got to uh putt really good you've got to rely on your putter um you've got to be confident so that's probably the biggest one uh, i would say more important than the other two because if you get in circle one or whatever and you're putting for birdie and you miss, you know, that really doesn't matter. You could chank a couple shots and then make a outside the circle putt or an inside the circle putt, and you're right there with the guy who threw two good shots and missed his putt. So it's weird how that adds up, but I think putting is very important. Of course, yeah. But for dough, right? Yep. Um, Chris Dickerson, thank you for joining us, and we'll be right back. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Joining us now is Paul Uliberry, and this isn't a mirage. This it's not a dream. We see you in person. You're here. Mm-hmm. You're playing golf this weekend. Are you? I am. Are, you are. Yes. Good. There's been a lot of question, and I, I jokingly bring that up. You've been battling some injuries, and I know you've tried, mm-hmm. but now you're back and you're ready. Break it down for everybody. 
I mean, it's good to be back for sure. Frustrating the last few, I mean, it, probably about six months, very frustrating, but put a lot of work in the last three months to, to try to get healthy, figure out what was going on. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. I, I, I told myself I wasn't going to come back till I got the okay from my PTs. And they told me that uh, this week I could come give it a go. So now I've seen some of those social media posts. You've you know been working with uh, multiple people trying to get he uh, healed and, and mm -hmm. fully recovered. You've made an attempt, right? You you were at the preserve, for instance, and you thought you were going to be good to go there, or or no, or it, what 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 did it take know, to pull you off of that one? Yeah, it's been day to day. So I didn't know if I was going to play or not till a few days prior, and uh, ultimately. You know, I didn't want to make the decision myself, so I left it up to my team. And they told me, probably not a good idea. Let's save it, uh, wait another week. And, um, you know, this, this game is, or this course, pardon me, is there's a premium on accuracy, not so much power. And they, they felt like knowing that, you know, take another week off, try to, try to build it up, get a little more healthy, that, you know, this would suit me a little better for a soft return. So scale of 1 to 100%. Um, where, where do you where do you put your health right now? I don't know. So uh, it's tough to say. I, you know, the last two and a half months I've played two rounds. Um, well, now three, two practice rounds here. Uh, first practice round was awesome. I felt great. Second one I was a little sore. So mm. to go three rounds in a row, I mean, we're just gonna see. You know, it was, it's one of those things to where we just kind of have to get out there and, and hopefully it holds up. Hopefully the, the work that I put in pays off and I'm able to get through those rounds with some good scores. And, and really this is a tournament to evaluate the rest of the season and, and where I'm at, if it can hold up for um, that amount of time, that amount of throws. And is this the an injury or a sort of injury where you're wavering like I think of an Eagle McMahon who's uh, exploring alternative health you know and recovery yeah. and there's you know obviously always conversations of surgeries or not is this a rest related injury is this a surgery possibility like what are what are the some of the options and the things you're weighing right now yeah so that's what's so frustrating about it is nobody really knows um there's a couple good ideas of of what could possibly going on be going on it's shoulder related but it's at the point where it's not, it doesn't hurt. It just gets, it just gets wore out. Um, and then it travels down the arm into the fingertips. So, you know, at first I thought, okay, it's just tendonitis. I can rest that, you know, I've dealt with that before in the, in the career, but you know, that didn't work. Um, there's a few other things. Uh, a few of the PTs thought it might be one of them was thoracic outlet syndrome, which is basically I'm not getting enough blood flow to my arm. So I'm not getting rejuvenated. Um, with en enough of that uh, blood, which, you know, that, that to rehab that, we did a lot of stretching, a lot of acupuncture, a lot of uh, cupping, um, saw a chiropractor. I mean, I, I've been through the works and that's, like I said, that's a frustrating part is we don't exactly know what's going on. Um, the best way I can explain it to people is like, if you take your arm and you push all the blood to the bottom and you feel that pressure at the end, that's what it feels like well, what it felt like all, all the time. And, you know, you just, yeah, that's not 100%. And so it, it's frustrating because we don't know what, if this doesn't, if I'm not able to get through this week, even if I am able to get through this week, depending on how I feel, you know, I'll really be able to evaluate the rest of the season and maybe go even deeper in the discovery of what's going on, uh, go to specialists, we'll do what I have to do, you know, because I'm uh, extremely frustrated on, not being able to play up to my potential. Yeah, and uh, of course the tour has missed you, but we got a little glimpse of you on the bag. Simon Lazat, yeah. I know that's certainly can't be nearly as fulfilling as going out there and you know vying for a title yourself, but to watch Simon go for his third event in a row, how did that conversations come about for uh, you to say, hey, I'll hop on your bag for the weekend? Oh man, I love watching Simon play, man. It's so exciting. He's playing at a very high level. Uh, and, you know, we get along and I feel like I'm a pretty good caddy. You know, I have a good caddy on my bag as well in Brad Hammock. And he's been, you know, a godsend for multiple reasons. Um, but I, I felt like Simon was going to play well and I wanted to be there and watch it, you know, up front. And it, it was a good pick. And, yeah, we, we, I feel like we did great. So I, I guess one of my final questions would be, 
it, it, fair to say you don't have specific expectations you're you're just trying to kind of fight through the weekend and then reassess is that mm -hmm. is that a good way you want to put it or do you have any other expectations for this weekend i think that's perfect you know um yeah i want to i want to get through a tournament and uh see where the touch is see how all that stuff is. i mean on, along the way this messes with everything it messes with your mental your um you know your confidence all of all of that stuff so to be back and playing i'm happy about that but i'm not somebody you know, I'm, I'm a player, and I'm a damn good one. I know I've known that, you know, my whole life, and that's a confidence that I have. And so to see that waiver, over the last cu couple months has been very tough, and it's been tough to keep that confidence. And so, as long as I come out of this weekend, you know, and I gain whatever confidence I can get from it, I'll be happy for sure. Well, and I'm going to sidetrack just briefly. Your mom, also an incredibly uh, confident, persevering woman that's mm -hmm. done so much. She endured some hardship, her and, and, your, and your dad uh, endured a hardship of losing the house a few months ago. Real quick, how's the recovery process? How's all of that going right now with her literally rebuilding? You know, it's incredible. They, the community really stepped up and, and came around and, and helped. Um, they have a studio already built and she's staying in there and they're building another one right now. and. I mean, they're trucking along. That's tough. You know, that's a tough thing to go through. Um, but like you said, man, incredibly just confident lady. I mean, that's my number one supporter, always has been, always will be. So when she's down, I'm down, you know. And so that, that was tough for us among, amongst me not playing good. I mean, that, that goes to the side, you know. Mom's, mom's the most important thing. Um, but it's been nice to see her kind of get a little more cheery in the last couple of weeks and hear that voice come back that that's important to me because she gives me confidence as well I mean she's my number one fan no matter what I always you know I, I uh, am a big believer in you know I guess you could call it dreaming like I always dream of things that I'm going to do in the future and um, kind of foreshadowing those things and some of the speeches that I've made up in my mind when I win a big one because I will win one again you know, she's at the top of the list to be in there. And so she's good stuff for sure. Yeah, she's an incredible soul. We know she's out there watching. Uh, Paul, we wish you the best of luck this week. Uh, we're looking forward to your return. And, you know, even if you don't complete all 54 holes, we know that you're going to continue to build and we're going to see all of that greatness that we know we have, uh, you have built up inside of you. And we're looking forward to it. I Thanks, appreciate pal. it, Terry. Yeah. Wild, we got Maddie O joining us. Welcome back, everyone. Maddie, I've 
coming in with a five-stroke margin of victory last weekend at the Charlie Ventner Memorial. You averaged above your rating. How are you feeling about coming into this weekend? Feeling pretty good. It's been uh, really hot for like the last every week since I've gotten home from California. So I feel like I'm overcooked right now. I feel like a lobster. So <laughs> I'm trying to take it easy this week so I can stay out there and stay to my best health, you know, out there. Well, come on. You, you have built-in advantages after you just said that. I think you have a shirt that has lobsters on it, and you're from Mobile, Alabama. Mm. How, how can you be overheating? Because I just got overcooked. I went to the beach, and then it was real hot last weekend in Louisville. Played an old two-rounder. Like, it's been a while. I'm actually three for three on the two-rounders every time this year. But I kind of like the one round these days. But then out here, like, I didn't realize it was 107. I played GK Pro Skins yesterday. And <laughs> somebody was like, it feels like 107 out here. I said, for real, I was pumped because I was like, at least I ain't being a wimp, you know. <laughs> it, it has been hot. We saw some weather roll through last night. I believe some storms rolled through. Cooled things off slightly, but it's definitely sticky here. And weather is going to be a conversation piece for tomorrow. So we'll keep all of that in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, explain to everyone real quick. When you say two-rounder, some people might not even know what you're talking about. We've got a lot of new fans. Oh, yeah. What does that uh, mean? So most every round I ever played until probably the last 10 years was played. as a, if, if it was a two-day tournament, you'd play two rounds one day. Sometimes sometimes two rounds on Sunday, but uh, you wake up like old school shotgun, right? You wake up at nine, sometimes eight, depending, and uh, grind a bunch of golf out. Like, <laughs> old school, you play it all day golfing. I kind of like it both ways, but sometimes in the heat it can be kind of too much sometimes. But Yeah, talking about 36 holes in a given day, and then sometimes, like you said, mm -hmm. 18 or 36 uh, on the next day, and now we're, we've softened you guys up. To, yeah. to just 18 a day, much longer courses, obviously. Uh, but seriously, you, like Chris Dickerson, who we just talked to a little while ago, you've really backed off these last couple of months. You were out on the West Coast. The last couple of months, though, you've slowed things down. Uh, I think wisdom teeth maybe is one of those things. What else has been keeping you on or off the course? Um, honestly, it's just so far from Mobile. Maybe, I don't know what, but it's just so far for especially me and Chris to, to go out to the West Coast and you know, it's really hard on our vehicles to drive all the way out there, or my vehicle, and then kind of be stuck out there. And if you fly out there, it's kind of like a four-week trip, so it's kind of like being away for four weeks without a car. And you want to do your – so you got to – got to kind of pick one or the other. So I picked the California stretch this year, and then next year I'll probably do the Oregon. But it's just hard for me not to have a car for that long and tour this. I'm too old for – the professional gypsy life you know <laughs> catching around like ubers and all that and not knowing what's next and not you know kind of doing what you want well and then that brings you know you talk about maybe going out there and if whether it's the west coast or the northwest uh is or isn't your style what is your style like whether it's that style of course or that style of travel what do you feel like encapsulates your style of like just courses in general or anything yeah. I don't know. It seems like every course I go to, somebody says, this is your style of course. So, uh, <laughs> well, that's, maybe that's a compliment. Yeah, So, but I just like, uh, I kind of like everything, I guess, too. But I just like knowing that I'm there and I'm able to play and take what that's given to me, honestly. But right. I fall in love with the Northeast, though, like golf, though-wise. I like it up there. Okay. Uh, certainly much cooler in those parts, for sure. Uh, last question for me, though, is, you know, here we are. We're, we're turning the corner at the halfway point in the season. Give yourself a quick uh, assessment or grade for how you feel like you've been playing so far up into this halfway point. I'd say it's like A-, minus. honestly. Uh, I've kind of had some, like, we've all heard about my health stuff all year, so I just feel like I've recovered. I've had COVID twice this year as well. So going through those, you know, and just – rebounding good and I come back off this three week which is a blessing because I feel like I'm like ready to go back out and play again because it's nice to have like a break break because I, sometimes I don't see how all of them do it all year without you know so it's good to have now I want to go on tour for 10 <laughs> weeks now because I might not be able to go home here in a few I get two weeks home after this I get one my last weekend off off I'm going to deep sea fishing rodeo next week and then <laughs> it's on from there so it's good to get like re rebuilt you know yeah. reboot it basically to uh, want I was to just, be out there uh, and i was just gonna say rejuvenated matteo means big things for disc golf means uh big things for all the galleries and crowds and all the spectators and fans out there i'm very much looking forward to it here's danny voss with another question or two for you always good talking to you terry 
Terry is a gem, isn't he? Hi, Matt. How you doing? I, I have one question for you. Uh-oh, quickie. <laughs> so Jim Orham will be inducted into the Disc Golf Hall of Fame uh, next week at the PDGA Masters and Junior World Championships. Mm -hmm. I just want to know, you know, what does that mean for you and what does that mean for your family? Uh, definitely means a tremendous a lot of happiness and just kind of glad it happened, you know, because it kind of almost seemed like it was never going to happen because it just felt like it could have been earlier. But I remember when he kind of was getting close to passing, he looked at me one time and was like, if I get inducted to the Hall of Fame, tell him I don't want it. But that only means he meant a lot because I know my dad that he wanted to get in before then. But it means a lot to our family, a lot to – and honestly, the game's grown so much, he'll probably get a lot more people know that he got in it now too. So, And actually hear the Southern National story now that disc golf's grown and – what it is and what it means so it can go it goes both ways but we're tremendously happy and i'm wish i could be there but i'll be there on you know cyber or something whatever y'all call the you know i'm not good with those internet words but you know i'll be there <laughs> yeah i know there's going to be some involvement and uh yeah, yeah I, I just know that this says uh it, i'm glad to hear that it means a lot and uh yeah you know, we're gonna see uh see that recognition yeah it'll be place. super cool and uh maybe i'll give a good you know, speech that make a change in a good way. <laughs> You're doing great. Don't you worry about awesome. it. Awesome. All right, this was Matty O. Uh, thank you, and we'll be right back. Thanks, Matt. Boom. Welcome back, everyone. Joining us now is our United States Women's Disc Golf Championship winner in Haley King. And Haley, you play disc golf because you love it, and you're not here to 
answer critics or analysts, but after not seeing you on the top at the early part of this year, to then walk away with a major last week, how does that feel? I mean, it feels pretty good. It tells me that what I've been doing to focus on myself is working and that I'm on the right path. Could you elaborate just a little bit on what you've been doing uh, in terms of getting yourself on that right path? Everyone's on a different path. What's your path been? I've just been trying to put myself in check and just discipline myself more. That's always been something that I've lacked. Um, I love sports. I'm kind of good at sports. So I've never really had to try to succeed. And now that disc golf is not that, you have to have pure dedication and just discipline. So that is something that I'm working on. Is, yeah. And I'm going to add on to that. You're relatively young or very young. How do you dig deep to find discipline? Because I, I think there's a lot of people who are on top of the world that do a lot of amazing things, but staying focused and, and finding your path. How, how do you find that discipline? Like what motivates you to find that discipline? Well, so recently I listened to Corday's TED Talk. Um, he's an artist that I really like. And he just said a lot of things that like resonated with me and that I just, it, he said it in the right way where it finally clicked and it's like the one thing I've always lacked is discipline. So I don't know, I'm just forcing myself to do things that I don't really like to do and still finding joy in it and making sure that like I'm not just going to piss myself off, that I'm working on something. So, Can you give us one example? I don't want to get uh, too into the weeds, but give us one example of something maybe that you wouldn't have been doing a month ago or six months ago that you're doing now. Uh, disc golf leagues. I do not like playing disc golf leagues and I actually found a really cool crew to go play out with uh, the Blair Mail team in Charlotte. So yeah. Uh, yeah I, I'm sorry I have to follow. Why don't you like leagues? I don't know it's like I mean I don't really like tournaments just because like I just like disc golf. I like throwing discs. <laughs> if I can throw 10 shots on every tee I will. So not being able to do that in a tournament is kind of a bummer you know. Uh, all right, so you're out there for the uh, the amount of throws and, and just enjoying what disc golf has to offer and the competitive side. Well, that just happens to be what you're really good at. Uh, I'll, I'll add on to that. You know, the week before at the Preserve, you finished in 25th. Again, probably not quite to the standards that you'd want for yourself. So what was the extra gear that you found? How did you dig deep to, to have such a turnaround from just one week earlier, 25th, and then taking first at a four-round major? Um. I would say one of my friends who helped me was Trevor Harbolt. He and I had a really good heart-to-heart, -heart and he was there with me in the final round at Preserve. Um, yeah, I finally just felt confident in myself and finally found what clicked and somehow brought it into U.S. Women's. Clearly it worked out well, and then I'll follow that up with about 24 hours ago, or less than, there was a specific drop from your manufacturer in Innova to commemorate your win, this major win, something that we've been seeing more and more often. How did that feel to see a, a unique drop of commemorative discs just to uh, celebrate your win? How'd that feel? It was really cool. They came out super quick and I think they might be sold out by now, which is really, really cool. Yeah. I know by the time I had to pull over and was trying to get one, I couldn't. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so you're heading into the back half of this season. You're currently sitting 12th in points. How confident are you about being able to push yourself up the, the DGPT standings? I mean, all I have to do is be out here playing the tournaments and I'm going to move up. And that's largely because we didn't see you at a number of the events, so all of your points that you're accumulating now will then push you up. Do you have a goal? I mean, does it mean something extra to get into, say, the top four and earn that first buy, or is that not necessarily what you're worried about? I don't really care about that. I just want to make it to the finales. <laughs> All right. Well, we've seen what you've done at the finale in the past, and now I'm going to hand it off to Danny Voss, who's got a couple for you. Hi, Haley. Good again. seeing you again. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate you as well for your major victory last week. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, you know, kind of going back to that, you know, watching you and Terry conclude that interview on the 18th green was one of the most, like, wholesome and touching moments from, from that tournament. Um, you know, it was clear to see that that was very meaningful for you and uh, the happiness that you were kind of exuding. So how do you take that positivity and, you know, bring it inside, carry it to this weekend, and then unleash it on the course? Well, I'm actually taking a little break after this event, so it's pretty easy for me to just, like, stay happy because I have another goal is just 
play the tournament, finish well, and then I get to get home, meet the new cat, and yeah. Awesome. What's the new cat's name? Jax. Jax. Yep. Classic. Gotta love it. Um, coming off of a, of a major victory, you know, sometimes it, sometimes you might see a, a, a player in any sport uh, experience, you know, maybe a little bit of a, a, a hangover, for lack of a better word. Um, it seems just by judging that by this conversation and you talking to Terry and your demeanor now, that that's not going to be the case. Um, what would it take for you to come out of this week and be, you know, continue that happiness, ride that wave through to your to your break that's coming up? Uh, really, I just want to maintain my level of confidence and decision making. Uh, I felt like last week I had probably the best decision making that I've had and yeah, I just want to keep that going into this week. Okay, very good. And I have uh, one more quick question for you. So you mentioned, um, you know, listening to a TED Talk and how that can affect your, you know, mental attitude and things like that. Um, and you've been, you know, a, a proponent for mental health and things like this, like all season long. Is there anything else, like whether it's a book or a podcast or anything like that, you, that you would recommend specifically to like amateur players that are, you know, looking to get in the right mindset? Uh, first, I would highly recommend watching the movie Rise. It's about Giannis. I'm not going to pronounce his last name. He plays for the Bucks. Um, that movie hits hard. And if you're a competitor, athlete, and you just like a good story, that is a very, very motivational movie. Um, there's a lot of books out there. I read a couple, mostly uh, just like positive reinforcement type of books so like things that are worded the correct way for your brain to understand mm -hmm. it and so you can like repeat that to yourself on the daily and just have confidence in yourself yeah, kind of develop your own mantra very good yeah that's all i have for you haley thank you so much for joining us congratulations once more on your major victory and uh yeah we'll be right back thank you
And joining us now is Fred Salas. Fred Salas, I apologize. Uh, from the Hall of Fame class of 2007. All right. PDGA number 3273. Fred, first of all, thank you for joining us. Uh, My pleasure. Thanks. Every Thanks single press conference, when we have these opportunities to talk to our Hall of Famers, it's always such an honor. And let's get a little background about yourself. You don't live far from here, right? But tell us about yeah, this about golf and when you got introduced. from here. I live in Crescent Springs. Um, I, I, I'm originally from New Mexico. So uh, Las Vegas, if, if you know, there's another Las Vegas. <laughs> and uh, I come from a very poor background. You know, my parents had 11 kids, and I'm seventh. And uh, but uh, I moved to. Uh, you know, I was in the service in the, after high school, and once I got out of the service, I learned I learned how to throw the frisbee in the service. So that's the mid 70s. And then uh, when I got out of the service, went to college. I used to do a lot of throwing and catching because you know there was no. I had no idea what disc golf was then, so throwing it like MTA you know what MTA is mm -hmm. um, I guess most people do but uh, then then I moved to Cincinnati and I met my wife in barber school and when I she's the one that introduced me to disc golf so uh, that was in 1980 and it's kind of been a blur from then you know, <laughs> well you got signed up for the PDGA uh, pretty quickly as you said you've been a member since right around 1980 1985 I, uh, I suppose my first PDGA uh, when I joined. So, it, and it's been an incredible road ever since then, for sure. We're here at this event largely in part to your efforts. You are responsible for the Idlewild course. Right. Talk to us about how this came to be. You know, I know you don't live far from here, but how did it come to be? Well, we. Uh I was the the course pro for the club, and uh, the parks wanted to uh, put a, a new course in this. They had just acquired this park. Actually, the airport actually owns the park, but they lease it to the to the parks department and uh, the Boone County Parks. And uh, they wanted a disc golf course here. I had just designed one for them down the street, and they took <laughs> those baskets and put them here. And because uh, they were the airport was expanding, and they wanted to. Uh, to move the disc golf course because they you know it's a great park department and uh, they they wanted uh, to keep disc golf you know yeah and it's been incredible and of course people will throughout the weekend and even through our press conference we'll hear the the planes going by of course very close to it and that is right. an interesting component knowing that the airport owns the property and leases it like you mentioned right. now w what is that like to know the entire world will be watching the entire world of disc golf and so many people rate and review this as one of the top destinations in the world. Right, yeah. How does that it's feel a, for you? Well, I'm really humbled by it. You know, like um, when we, Bob Herbert and I, you know, co-designed it, uh, Bob was the one that wanted to make it, you know, the par fives, because he played golf in college. And he wanted to make par fives and par fours and tough, to, but tough ones too, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, cut the holes through the woods and we, we actually did it by hand uh, originally <laughs> uh, bow saws and hack saws and all that kind of stuff <laughs> but anyway it was it was great being able to do that it took us two or three years just to get it playable uh, uh, we started in, in 98 and then uh, finished uh, it was playable in 2001 we had a tournament and most of the players would have said that it wasn't playable because it was <laughs> <laughs> it was very rough and uh, anyway, it just got better ever since. But uh, to see it to this extent, uh, you know, it took a lot of hard work. It took a lot of people. I had a lot of help, and um, it's just amazing. I'm now, now, when we fast forward 22 years later, we see, of course, people throwing way farther than they were right. back in, in the you know early 2000s, right. and when people like Ken Climo and Des Redding were dominating the game, but. Now here we are with these super fast discs and par fours and par fives and the pro tour being here. Do you do that? Does anyone consult you or Bob when they're talking about making a change or adjustment, or is the course pretty much just set up and ready to go in in any given configuration? Well, uh, I don't know if you know, but I, I used to own the Natty, 
and then I, I sold it to Jason and Adam. And then once they took over, I kind of just stepped out of the picture. I had because I, I I hardly play anymore. I you know maybe play once a week, and it's just casual. I haven't played in a tournament. I think I played here. The last tournament I played was here in, in 19, and uh, maybe 20. I don't know. And uh, you know I was horrible, but <laughs> but I got to play it. So and that was that was that was fun for me. I, I don't think I even finished. But uh, uh, Jason and Adam are are doing an exceptional job with uh, and and you, you know of taking over and just kind of like and they pretty much you know haven't done anything that we do not uh, do not agree with so everything's it's been, okay. it's been passed off and in in good, in good hands, hands right. and those guys have done an incredible job as you've said and right. and to know again that we have a pro tour event here what, what, explain to everyone what even the year you know you were inducted in 2007 what what was disc golf like even in 2007 you were obviously a, a viable candidate and and in, inducted then but what was the difference even just 15 years ago i think that was pre destroyer you know uh, uh i think 2007 is at the pro worlds roughly is when the destroyer came okay, out actually so right, yeah you're okay. right around then so yep. it was uh it was different i i used to try to throw destroyers <laughs> you know like but you know i would get in i'm over I consider myself an overall player, so. Mm. Uh, but I, 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 for my distance, I would I would use n new discs, and the throwing new destroyers was not a good idea. So I never did well in the distance. <laughs> but uh, it was, you know, the, this the disc was still very good, but the athleticism uh, that there is now is it was different. I think. Uh, we weren't a lot of hi a bunch of hippies throwing frisbees <laughs> anymore, but they, uh, it was still, uh, you know, like Climo and them was still, I think he was still maybe on the downslope of his career, but they were still very, very good players. Yeah, and Climo winning in 2006, the world's in Augusta there. I think back to when you were getting started, the, you know, the Eagle uh, was maybe one of the prominent discs, and then okay. eventually you right. saw, you know, things like cyclones come along, and you've exactly. seen truly, you know, at one time, the, you know, discs like the Stingray and the Cobra were the fastest throwing discs on the planet, right? Exactly. Yeah, and they were like uh, very good discs. <laughs> you know, I mean, you could do anything with them, roll them. You know, maybe not so much a forehand, but uh, you, they were very um, durable and not. You know, very good disc. Yeah, everything that you needed there. Um, Versatile, yeah. Maybe one of my questions before I uh, toss it over to Danny. Um, do you have uh, aspirations? Are there other parks departments, you know, knowing you've got this crown jewel and this feather in your cap that's been the Idlewild course, yeah. uh, do, do you actively go out and seek out other course designs? I know you've worked on some others, but do you do you actively do that? I, I get uh, calls, uh, not a lot, but I do get called because of, what we did here at Idaho, yeah, and Boone. I think uh, Dave Whitehouse at Boone County. Uh, he recommends me sometimes, but I think he's going more with Jason and and Adam. Well, because it's of what uh, they've done, yeah. Uh, this, yeah, along with products you've developed, stores you've run, uh, everything that you've done throughout all the years, I we appreciate everything uh, that you've My ever pleasure. been a part of. It's been incredible. Uh, Danny, I think from the PDGA has another question or two. I wanted to say, though, thank you very much for your time, and uh, thanks for being uh, an ambassador and a steward of the game that you've been. Here's thank Danny. You. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm a barber, so I, I like your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. I will take that all day long. Thank you. You got great hair. All right, I'm definitely going to keep my hat on then after that one. <laughs> that's what I. That's why I wear mine. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll keep this one really quick. I asked the same question to Adam Jones, the TV, TD of the event. Uh, and this question actually came from Twitter. Um, Idlewild is one of the most impressive courses in a public park. Uh, you know, you were mentioning how, how important the public parks are. Sure. Um, so how does a place like this continue to challenge top pros, uh, d you know, despite the proliferation of private courses? Yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I would say the sponsorship would be a big thing. That, you know, if, if the money's there, I think the players will come if they, you know, they could – find a spot for a place like this but uh i think that the course says a lot for itself and uh i think the, the players like it and i know the the locals love it you know they we designed it for to so we could have a place to play you know the the the, the professionals 
and a tough place to place and and nobody would none of the amateurs would come but it, as it turned out everybody came so yeah it's it's done well yeah yeah when you have the locals behind it that's right. probably the secret sauce huh well that's all we got thank you very much for joining us and uh terry would you like to thank you yeah real quick uh i i do before we do let you go um you know you being an historian in the game i also want to get uh maybe an initiative or a a plea that you had you talked about people like dave greenwell other hall of famers right, right. um you'd love to see some of those people uh, have the opportunities to get maybe get in the world championships is that is that something yeah, you want well, to quickly what, touch hap- on? what happened with dave greenwell this year he's played in every world's championship uh, which is i don't know 40 or so and uh this year he didn't qualify, so you know he didn't get in. So he's not going to be at at the world. So I think that if the PDGA could uh, just uh, have earlier signups or for the Hall of Famers, uh, or even safe spots for Hall of Famers, it'd be great. Yeah, and and I think I, what you're bringing up is, and why I wanted to make sure we got it in here. I think that's a a great overarching uh, conversation that can be had, whether it's previous champions, Hall of Famers, you know, some of those special considerations to really uh, continue to honor and thank all of the, you know, the godfathers and, and godmothers and forefathers. The old guys. Uh, uh, all, all, all of the ambassadors and pioneers that have truly right. laid the groundwork, people like yourself, and, uh, you know, certainly want to recognize and honor them in, in every possible way. So I, I wanted to make mention of that. And we love you, Dave. Thank you. Uh, obviously another Hall of Famer, and right. I wanted to get that all in there. So with that, Fred, we do, again, we thank you for joining us. We're going to conclude our press conference here at the 2022 LWS Open, presented by Dynamic Disc and the Natty. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We'll see you tomorrow morning for round one of the FPO coverage right here on the Disc Golf Network.